Welcome to everyone here at Macquarie University, uh, whether in person, via Zoom, uh, from Australia, or from further afield. I'm not sure if anybody got up at four. <laughs> we, shall, we, shall, we shall see. Um, it's wonderful to have you with us for an afternoon of poetry and craft and thinking about stuckness as creative process. Um, I'd like to begin with an acknowledgement of country. Uh, we acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land on which Macquarie University stands, the Wadmadigal clan of the Darug Nation, whose cultures and customs have nurtured and continue to nurture this land since time immemorial. We pay our respects to the elders past and present. Thanks, you. Um, so I'm not going to hold up proceedings at all. Uh, instead, I'd like to get straight to the good stuff. Um, the poetry. And uh, we're lucky enough to be joined by four poets. Um, so we have the wonderful Professor Oz Hardwick from Leeds Trinity University, uh, Associate Professor Marcel Freeman, some of you will know her as a most amazing uh, teacher of creative writing, mentor, friend, colleague. Uh, <laughs> Dr Willow Drummond, brilliant in teaching in poetry in so much. And the marvellous Elizabeth <laughs> Walton, whose poetry and writing always a source of delight. Um, <laughs> thank thank you. you all for being here. Um, and without further ado, um, Dr. Professor, oh, sorry, <laughs> Professor Oz Hardwick, um, who I will introduce um, if, that's, uh, if I can get the right one. Um, so um, Oz is here with us from Leeds Trinity University. Uh, he's an international award-winning poet and academic with a particular interest in prose poetry, whose work has been published and performed internationally in and on diverse media. He has published 13 well-received poetry collections, a number of collaborative works, and has had several hundred individual poems in anthologies and journals. No stuckness there. <laughs> um, um, he has edited and co-edited numerous anthologies and has published articles on poetics and creative writing practice and pedagogy. Oz has contributed to many international conferences, including organising the first UK Prose Poetry Conference in 2019, and has spoken and read his work at numeral, numerous festivals, held residencies in the UK, Europe, US and Australia, and along with Anne Caldwell, has recently edited the collection of essays, Prose Poetry in Theory and Practice, Rutledge 2022. Thank you so much, Oz. <laughs> oh, oh, applause. Um, thank you so much for that. Um, I suppose the two things I ought to say before I start reading a few things are um, warnings. One, I'm still dazed after travelling, um, so I could go off at tangents even more than usual, although actually going off at tangents is sort of what I do for a living, really. So, um, so, so that's sort of okay. Um, the other one is there is something in the, the, the rich array of wonderful smelling plant life here that has just set off my allergies. So apologies if I start, particularly for people on Zoom, if I start hacking down the microphone. Um, very, very apologies for that. <clears throat> so um, I've, I'll read a, a, a few things. I'm still not entirely sure what. I'll see how I feel. But I'd... I've had a few conversations, and indeed was just um, talking to, to Marcel um, about uh, memoir and memory and, and so on. So I'd like to, to start off with a sort of a, a memory poem about my, about my childhood. It's called Workers' Playtime, which is a, a phrase is taken from a, a wireless programme that used to be, and I deliberately say wireless rather than radio, because we're going back a long time here. Being too poor to own a car, we'd book a bus trip each bank holiday to the southwest coast or later to the moon. The coast had donkeys and fairground rides, but the moon had better rock pools. And Dad and I would spend hours with nets on bamboo canes, catching quick fish with bulging eyes and transparent skin, just to see their atom hearts beating before we gently lowered them back into their natural element. I'd fill my pockets with vivid shells that carried voices from deep space, patterned like galaxies, though I knew that back in my bedroom they'd be silent and dark. 
Most of the shops would be shut, but we'd buy brittle wafers that tasted of vinegar and sea air, then strawberry ice cream in vacuum-sealed packs. We'd break even in the penny arcades, then stand on the shore that in those days stretched forever, skimming slivers of feldspar in the rough direction of earth. We'd both doze in our seats on the way home, but I remember the retired cosmonauts singing in Russian at the back of the bus as they passed round lunar spirit in an engraved flask. One time, Dad let me try a sip, and I can still feel it burning on my tongue. So that's sort of about my childhood, um, which was partly growing up by the sea in a very sort of working class family household and there would be dad's works outings to, the, to places further along the coast and so on. But also it was the time of the, the first sort of space explorations and the, the excitement that that brings to a eight, nine year old boy, I guess. And they become blurred in the past um, and in memories thereof. And I think as we're talking about sort of the getting stuck and so on, I think one of the strategies that I do tend to use is when I'm, well, I, I don't really get stuck. I'm the wrong person to talk about it. But there is that sort of, you know, you fuse just two bits of the same memory and see how they mesh together and the incongruities of it, I suppose, I find kind of interesting. And so, although I've had a very, very dull life, um, I have a, a very, quite a, a rich imaginative recall of it, which I, um, sort of comes from putting the more exciting world events alongside, I guess. Um, I'm going to read another one which might come up again. Um, I won't say much about it, um, but it might, something might come up when we're talking later on. And this book came out last year. Um, <coughs> apologies to deaf and Zoom people. Um, so although it's not particularly explicit in here, there's the the sort of spindly fingers of COVID come through it. Um, this is called The Isolation Waltz. For a long time, my heart was a schoolroom with gas lamps and iron benches, with low light painting each surface in pastel chalks. I turned at the jangle of a dropped gold locket containing a snip of baby hair or a wisp of northern fog. There was a woman in a starch blue dress with blue hair and blue lips whose face and fingers were coral and whose feet were wrapped in iron. She held a chest the colour of a tiger's eye, winking, and told me she was a fan of improvisation and that I was a high-risk category. In the stillness that followed, traffic passed between the songs of blackbirds and my cheap alarm clock rattled. A dog barked. And when she offered me the box, it smelled of old library books, and in my hand it felt like a label I couldn't unpick from a cheap office chair. And as I watched, the box opened itself, and inside was my heart and a photograph for five young men strolling down Broadway back in the 1970s. I took my heart, stepped into the picture to the sound of a C harmonica, and there, over on the sidewalk in the shadow of the Empire State Building, was a dropped gold locket. I stooped to pick it up, but it was as heavy as floorboards. I closed my eyes and saw a green pool in a dark wood, and all I could hear was a stranger from the south with a funeral on his mind, reminding me that I had a class in less than an hour. His voice sounded like frogs. It's uh, a strange sort of disjunction, dis disjoined, um, I suppose, dream exploration, um, which came, and, and again, it's one of those conversation earlier on about that sort of teaching in the, the sort of Zoom and Teams era. Um, and I was coming up with exercises for my students to do quite a distance and that's one of the, that poem came out of it and I'll perhaps sort of talk about it in a bit but it was that sort of how on earth do you prompt people when their sort of their world so enclosed so it was that a lot of my students being stuck with things and sort of okay yeah but we'll go this way now and see where that takes you
The, I, I realise I'm reading quite slowly and waffling. Um, I'll read one more from this and just a couple of bits from uh, the, the other collection and then uh, I'll stop for now. This is Population Zero. Um, and I won't say anything about it, I'll just get on with it. Normal is the town at the bottom of the hill, backing onto the sea. It's the whitewashed pub and the post office closed for lunch, and it's the row of chapels converted to holiday lets. It's the railway embankment that ends in empty space and the archive of proposed developments subject to funding bids. I remember normal when it was nothing but sandcastles and donkeys in straw hats, when there was nothing to eat but lurid ices and we worked ten-hour shifts building barks from wooden lolly sticks. I saw it shrink as politicians packed their navies into glass bottles, leaving them to gather dust behind the bar in the old boys' club, and I remember visiting for the funeral of the last living inhabitant her coffin lost beneath swathes of wreaths, while home movies stuttered along dockyard walls, filling in for family and friends. As far as I know, Normal may have been ironed flat in the last war, or stolen away by the sea. But when I stop late at that lay-by before the last hill, all the stars are exactly where they used to be, and the red call box glows on the darkened verge. Everything looks normal, but I know better than to answer when the phone rings. And I'd just like to, to read one thing from this. Um, well, I say it's one thing, it'll be a couple of short things put together. Um, this came out this month. Um, it's a sequence of 18 fragments about time and um, failed memory, I suppose, or um, unreliable memory. Um, and I'll just read the, the first two tiny ones without a break and the very last tiny one. Um, you could read it in any order pretty much this apart from the first and last poem. When I was bud I was tremble, I was tight yes and the R of near petal, leaf shade and therefore complexity. I was the situation, the scenario, the possibility of, the likelihood of, stretch and press. I was more than, other than, and the same as, fold and touch, simple intricacy. I was the still O of inevitable and the what of if, convolution. I was but the potential, the conundrum. Bud was the me of me. And when I was leaves, I adopted the habits of leaves, their gait, their accents, their tastes in music and cinema. I buzzed late night metros with caffeine and carbohydrate molecules, green in flickering neon, a superhero in my own comic book, Captain Chloroplast, saviour of the world. Now, high on a black whim, I am wood, fossilising into stone, becoming static, balance, archivist of green. I know what I like and it's all my own. A realist novel with neither character nor conclusion, a looped tape echoing itself. A crow clatters by, holy wafer locked in its cynical beak. Yet green becomes green, remains green, enacts the green that rides the night bus building conurbations as it goes. And that's me for now. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Oz. Uh, next up, we have Associate Professor Marcel Freeman. As well as being a much-loved teacher, colleague, friend and mentor here at MQ, uh, Marcel is a published uh, poet and researcher whose research focuses on creative writing and its practice, theory and pedagogy. She has published articles on the practice and theory of creative writing with a current interest in cognition, creativity and theories of extended and distributed cognition in writing process. She also researches poetry and poetics with a specialty in ekphrasis. Marcel's third book of poetry, Spirit Level, is published by Puncher and Wattman uh, from 2021, uh, and her two previous collections are White Lines Vertical Hybrid Publishers 2010 and Monkey's Wedding, Island Press Co-op 1995, which was highly commended for the a a ASL ASAL uh, Mary Gilmore Award. For over two decades, her poetry has appeared in anthologies and literary journals in Australia and overseas. Thank you, Marcel. Thanks. Um, okay, so um, my latest book is this one, Spirit Level. Um, it came out uh, in, at the end of 2021. Um, I'm actually not going to read from the book uh, today because um, 
these poems took me a long time to write. <laughs> and you could hear from the dates that Willow was citing in, in my publications that, um, her, that I, I have been stuck a lot over the last 20 years <laughs> simply because um, I wasn't uh, able to write as much as I wanted to. And now being retired, I have a new writing project which is an extension of, of much of what I've been doing. So um, a lot of the poems in, in both all my books are really deal with memory and um, the memory born of migration. Um, and um, memory particularly, I think, born of migration from the country I grew up in, um, which was South Africa, um, during the years of apartheid and I won't say too much about that other than the new project seems to uh, have much as I've wanted to move on and do other things um, there's really been a lot of um, underpinning to what I was doing before that still needs to be excavated so um, I'm in the process now of doing that and I'm going to read three poems from which are all really recent and I'll be able to talk about stuckness <laughs> about that um, as well so um, I'll give a little bit of preamble to each poem simply because um, it does need it, but the, the, the project really is shaping up to be a sort of a memoir in poetry. And so each poem is a kind of a vignette uh, and, will, and deals with aspects uh, and emotional aspects in particular of um, memories that have come to me, but that are important in shaping, I suppose, an ethical stance to um, the life that I led while I was there. Um, so. The first poem um, is called Mineshaft, Gold Reef City, 1983. So the poem has a sort of biographical entry, which is, I, um, I'll just give you some dates just to contextualize. So um, I was born in 1951. Um, so I grew up there through my early childhood and all the way through to my um, early to mid-twenties, then I left South Africa and went to the UK in 1977 and then came to Australia in 1983. Um, during those times that I, and I, I never went back there to live as I knew I wouldn't, um, the times, the years that um, we, you know, I had left there, I obviously went back to visit the place and to see family there and this poem really came out of one of the visits back to South Africa which was quite soon after I'd come to Australia um, and it's called Mineshaft, Gold Reef City, 1983, Gauteng, Johannesburg. So Gauteng is the province that's been renamed and Johannesburg is the city I grew up in. The Gold Reef City, um, the Gold Reef Mine is actually a gold mine, a very, very deep gold mine that um, is still operational. And what's been built, this is really quite bizarre, what's been built around it is a theme park. Um, and so tourists can go down a shaft, um, only a little way, not the same as you'll hear. Um, but around that also, it's close to uh, the casino that was built there, which was really how the funding for the apartheid museum was, was uh, raised, um, which was then built after the country changed in 1995, when the first proper democratic election happened there, after Nelson Mandela had been released. So there's just a little bit of history that you can get a bit of a, a sense of it. Okay, the poem. Mineshaft, Gold Reef City, 1983. You've returned, a tourist now, the country on the verge of emergency, somewhere beyond your sight line. You enter the clanking cage, the lift descends half a mile, walls of black rock, a theme park mimicry of the plummet five miles down in darkness for workers on the mines. Your helmet lamp, still dimmed to the real labour on which the city of your birth and education was built. Down, further down, heat in the air, silence, a taste of something brutal, cruel. Later, you will venture descents more honest than this close to the surface gazing. 
might even touch a hidden core, unearthed to broken light, what was lost of human warmth when you lived on these hard, stony ridges, alongside black workers, no right of place, the riches denied them. The rock walls glitter, intermittent as stars, how you came to be here, where your immigrant forebears had settled. Theirs was part of a great story of survival. Yours, the country ringed with fences, dust clinging to fingers touching the walls. Remember 1976, you were the white generation with freedom to leave. You could sever from your unbelonging, the skin of complicity if you stayed. Later, from another country, you'll watch the coming of freedom, truth-telling never completed. You will learn how truth died languageless in black holes of torture cells, and you will not forget the old reef shafts, the mines, the lure of gold seam buried in rock underground, dry air and shanties, a city hardened, sundered by its griefs, and always your compulsion to descend, to want some small misshapen nugget, its surface pockmarked like bullet holes in whitewashed walls in hands of dust. Okay, so the next poem um, which I wrote, I thought about this poem for a while because the idea for it had come to me in one of the many things that I had had to take out of the previous poem. <laughs> Working from memory, there's just too much with history, there's too much with research, there's too much. Um, so it's really been a sifting. And this poem was sitting around in my head and then reading a number of texts sort of started to make it coalesce in my mind. And this one was a really easy poem to write because the ideas had already come together. So the line um, that I had taken out, one of the lines from the previous poem was called, I Wanted Pelandaba Rock. And this poem, this next poem is called Pelandaba. Um, I'll just explain a little bit. Pelandaba uh, is a, a word that comes from African languages. Um, it's actually a place. It's a place um, which was a couple of hundred miles north of Johannesburg, where I lived. It, was, it then became the nuclear station, but that's got nothing to do with my poem. Um, it was also a farm back in the 1930s, a farm called Pelindaba. And while I was sort of mashing around with this idea in my head, I was reading, because um, I've gone back to reading some South African literature, and I was reading Athel Fugard's, um, the script for his film called The Guest which he wrote in 1977. And that, um, the film and the play is about the Afrikaans poet Eugene Marais, whom I had uh, studied, had to study in Afrikaans when I was at school because we had to learn the language. He was a wonderful poet actually, and Afrikaans poetry, much as the, you know, the language so loaded politically and ethically, um, it was really what started me off on poetry because I loved the sound of it. Um, anyhow, he um, was an interesting figure, a bit of an outsider, and um, Fugard deals with him. Uh, he was uh, addicted to morphine, and he had gone to this farm at a place called Pelandaba to try and dry out, and uh, that didn't work out. But he also did quite a lot of research when he was up there, and he had this kind of weird sort of spiritual idea of the soul and the land. And he wrote a, a book that's actually come into a lot of interest is being paid to it in terms of um, embodied cognition at the moment. It was called um, The Soul of the White Ant. He believed that the ant hill, uh, the white ants, the colony of white ants worked as one soul, if you like. I thought you'd enjoy that, Willow. <laughs> Anyhow, that's all by the side. So here's my poem. Uh, and it isn't by the side, you'll see. Pelindaba. I wanted the warmth of Pelindaba rock, the solid cliff face heft on the ground, wanted not to forget how it was, scent of air near a river, water running over rock, monkeys leaping, grey herons stepping through shallows. 
Years later, through the fence of a gated village, the Yixke River, a wide stream, oily and littered with plastic, flowing from Alexandria. Still, the resonance of ochre gray rocks, moving water streaming, deviating around the stones, their solid weight on the riverbed in winter midday sun, cries of water geese and weaver birds, and the grating edges, teeth of the barbed wire fence, sharp between my body and the river. Still later, I will learn that Peli, Peli Ndaba is Sutu for end to dialogue, which could mean, as the Afrikaans poet wanting his own peace on the farm Peli Ndaba saw it, end of conflict between the land and the soul, perhaps for him, completion. But also, it infers from end of dialogue, end to dialogue, a closing, end of reciprocity, the hardness mapped onto this place, what dies when vision walled over with stones fails to look upon the eyes of another. Okay, and I've got one more to read. I think I've got time. Yes? Okay, so this poem um, is a questioning that I had in my own mind because I've been Run, mem remembering and wondering about my own father who, who died now nearly 20 years ago. Um, I won't say too much about my dad, but um, it's a long story how I came to, write the, to ask the question of, of the title of this poem, which is called, Did My Father Read Naught for Your Comfort? And I have to tell you a little bit about what that means. <laughs> Um, this book is going to have some uh, notes at the back. <laughs> um, so, Nought for Your Comfort was a book that was written in about 1955. It was really published 1957. Um, so I was, you know, just a little girl about six years old then. Um, and it was written by an Anglican priest who uh, had come and was working in a mission, as a mission, superintendent of a mission school in Johannesburg. He was a very active man, very political man. And um, he uh, eventually uh, was called back by the church because he was becoming a nuisance to the, gov the apartheid government. But he wrote this book, which is called Naught for Your Comfort, which is quite a devastating title if you think about it. And the, re the way I came to this was I was doing a bit of research trying to find out about a particular organisation that I knew my father had belonged to and his business partner was called the African Children's Feeding Scheme. And so I googled it and then it, I learned that um, Trevor Huddleston had been one of the founders of the scheme back in 1950, early 1950s and 60s to try and feed children who were just starving because of apartheid. And my dad actually um, started a factory which made a food that would be nutritious enough to very cheaply feed children and get, give them back their capacity to grow. Um, so there was Trevor Huddleston, whom I'd completely forgotten about. And together with that came the memory, the image of that a book, but the, the book that he had written called Not For Your Comfort, sitting on the shelf in our study when I was growing up. And I knew it was there, I could see it, I knew exactly what it looked like, and it was the image of that book that actually got this poem going. Okay, and without further ado. So, did my father read Naught for Your Comfort? The question I ask about a book I walked past a thousand times on the shelf in my father's study. It seemed dusty, old and alien to my teen years, scratchy with rebellion. No time or inclination for an Anglican priest in Johannesburg back in 1955, writing the broken heart of the country. And he wrote about the music of Sophia Town, heartbeat of a people soon to be evicted. The cassock priest had bought a trumpet for a passionate boy, and Masakela's jazz echoing through a history still to come cutting through the crushing of ambitions. Now, reading Father Huddleston's witness, his rage and prescience, his charge to thwart hunger, it is as if I am reading around the edges of my father. Immigrant from the Jewish shtetls, 
The choices he faced in 1960 South Africa answered not with words, but acts and deeds. The engineer who built a factory devised a food to cost a penny each day, the nutrients to feed starving children, their bellies distended with kwashioko, to save a life, to save the world. His dogged response in a system premised on privations of care. Often he'd find ways between the hard walls of apartheid, stepping through the side doors of offices, paying pass fines for his workers, for years protecting the man who walked, who worked with no legality in our house, who came from nowhere, no pass to stay. Nothing to comfort them, said the priest, to wield blindness, to the salving of conscience, white lives existing behind silences of censorship, kept apart from what would be seen more coldly with each decade, Sharpeville, 1960, bannings, imprisonments, conflicted darkness, unease profound enough to undo a man. The words in a book kept on the shelf, were they a reminder to a heart seeking warmth in the bleakness of the void, to bring repair in this broken world, to bear for the children against the shame? Okay, that's my lot for this. <laughs> uh, um, next up, we have Elizabeth Walter, uh, who is an Emirates candidate here at Macquarie University and holds a Master of Creative Writing. Quarry uh, She has publications in Brush Strokes, the 2023 Ros Spencer Poetry Prize Anthology, Meniscus and Overland. Elizabeth received the Anne Edgeworth Fellowship and second place in the AAWP and Wallara Digital Literary Awards. Elizabeth, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> and, um, <laughs> um, yeah, so should I read that way or that way? It doesn't matter. <laughs> okay. Um, I'd probably like to continue on with the food theme. Um, these are two pieces that I wrote as part of my Masters of Creative Writing here at Macquarie. Um, and they both uh, do elaborate on the food theme. So the first one is Anaphora to the Taste of Coastal Bloom. It's a poem that I wrote about um, as uh, part of Willow's uh, course. Uh, who, Willow, who I had never written poetry before I took Willow's course. Um, it is a poem that I wrote about um, tasting. Uh, I have a, a, a garden with a lot of fruit trees. So it's a poem that I wrote about the taste of the blossoms. Because when we grow fruit um, or food, we can eat many parts of the food that we often don't think of eating. So this is about tasting the um, different types of blossoms and seeing what they taste like. Anaphora to the taste of coastal bloom. Uh, I should say also, it's slightly concrete, so it's in little petals, five petals coming down the page. Blossom of almond, pink stamen falling to regal shorelines of sepal. The hint of heat and the bloom is undone to the calyx, so quick in the mouth. Mmm, almond, mmm, almond drizzled in marzipan. Blossom of pear, flushed with the pink throat of crimson hair, rushing stamens invite the kiss of the coast. Legs of blue banded bees compressed in pyrus pollen. Be quick, perianth, place in the mouth and swizzle. Blossom of plum, House of man, plum the czar, plum Victoria, house of woman. Spent king, white petal, old queen, white coat, take even turns in rotational symmetry. To the sea bitter now, though dulce in summer, should kingdoms of parrots and pupae consent. Blossom of Granny Smith, domestic malice, frail skin bonnets, rocking to sweet, 
immerse sprigs in seaside spring water, then sip. Falls to the mouth through summer fresh meadows. No crunch, but the essence is there. Blossom of almond, plum, apple and pear. Suck and then see. Prunus amygdalus, prunus dulcis, malus persica, peaches in honey. Pears on crushed ice by the beach. Persian droops and ancient poems. Petaled pentagons of bliss. Thank you. Um, and one more, uh, which is eggplant, <laughs> following on from our theme of food. Um, so this also is written uh, as uh, part of Michelle's course, and it's arising from a poem by Peter Balakian, which I listened to in my kitchen before I took a trip to see my dad. And this is what happened, how that all happened. So it's after Peter Balakian's poem by the same name of Eggplant. So much wrapped in the leaves of stuffed cabbage, the sweetness of late season love apples and slow roasted romas. My laptop played eggplant in my homeland, my kitchen, while I sliced mad fruit, listening to the mussel stock brew. Listening to Balakian's voice journey his purpled mood. I cried at the white dishes on his table. How the moon looked in that part of the world. Sunday, I travelled the state to homelands of old. For Dad's birthday, I carefully refrigerated the stock for the soup. There were no plates in his house anymore. No no <laughs> pallets, sorry, no, no platters. They'd been given to neighbours and grandchildren who threw them away before they went overseas with no plans to return. I arranged the prawns and mirin drenched peaches for the guests on a plate from next door. Dad did not wait for me to ladle his lunch. He used his nonagenarian hands. Thank you. Thank you, Sarah. Um, and our last poet reading um, for the afternoon is Dr Willow Drummond, an Australian poet, researcher and sessional lecturer who teaches in the Masters of Creative Writing program at Macquarie University. Her interdisciplinary research draws upon theories of distributed cognition to illuminate creative writing cognition and practice. Willow's scholarship and poetry can be found in text, axon, Cordite Poetry Review, Australian Poetry Journal, The Canberra Times, Ireland, Griffiths Review and elsewhere. Willow has been the recipient of a Vice-Chancellor's Commendation for Academic Excellence for her PhD in Creative Writing 2019, a Career Development Grant for Poetry from the Australia Council for the Arts, 2020, shortlisted for the Val Vallis Award 2022 and runner-up in the Tom Collins Poetry Prize 2021. Her debut collection, Moon Rass, was published by Punter and Watman in 2023 and is shortlisted for the Five Islands Poetry Prize for a post book of poetry. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Michelle. Um, okay, so the poems that I'm going to read today uh, are all from Moonras, my, my debut collection. Um, they chart a journey of drafting that makes visible various attempts, both active and subconscious, to kind of locate and gather the language that allowed me to say the unsayable, to borrow a term from poet and scholar Paul Hetherington, to say the unsayable around a particular topic. Um, Thinking through and preparing for today, I can see that they're actually both an example of being stuck in the sense of being unable to get at what you want to get at in the way that you hope, but also stuck in the sense of being preoccupied with something, and a couple of you have mentioned this, kind of unable to write about anything else, that is when you're kind of able to write at all, just returning and returning and returning um, to a particular topic. 
Um, that was happening with these poems. So uh, my um, PhD uh, was kind of interested in, in creative cognition and then I was looking at um, uh, the poetics of Denise Levitov and she says a, a beautiful thing in an essay in her collection, A Poet in the World, um, about the various ways that poems come to us. Most of the time, she says, they require numerous drafts and they can kind of be coaxed into being. But sometimes they seem to arrive out of nowhere and kind of arrive almost fully formed and it's kind of spooky and, and Oz mentioned that before too. Um, and that's most likely because a lot of the work has gone on already um, in the subconscious via reading, um, via other activities, or perhaps via the writing of other poems. So I'm going to read you four short poems today um, and then we can chat a little bit more about their drafting journey later. Um, but each of them deals with the experience of gender transition from the perspective of a life partner, something that it seemed there was very little language for at the time I was writing these poems. It was a little while ago now. Um, the first three were part of what was originally uh, a sequence or seemed to be going to be a sequence of five poems, um, though only three survived. Um, and in hindsight, I could see that they were necessary to write the fourth poem, which to me at the time seemed like one that came out of nowhere. But of course, other stuff had gone on. So I'll read the sequence, the three poems from the sequence first, um, which is called Axis of a Shifting World, and then I'll read the fourth poem. One. In winter light, each tree slides on an axis to human eye invisible. Toward the helix lookout, tiny birds like moths rest warm bodies on tall grasses. Each slender blade bends in gesture of giving. So many bodies up here. Hill to toe, I coax my own, round reedy hill in walking meditation. My hope to catch a glimpse of what it is to be a small, smooth body bending a blade of grass. Two. Lean into me. Let me stand where you can no longer. Solitude surrounds us, of course, even two by two as we are in the ache of it. From this vantage we glimpse a kite, let it drag us away, kick off the dust. Lean into me. Around us is sky and the remnants of ritual. And you, and now you, the axis is shifting. Although it is possible I had you in mind all along, you are rewriting me. My maps are recharting. Will you know me when you become and I am rewritten? Three. I need to be in the world to feel air, breath of lives, various faces, not only on subways, more than petals, wings, material, immaterial, the movement of limbs, mine, theirs, the flicker of life on brows, various, bustling women with prams, old couples touching in their concern, still. From there, of course, I think of you. I think about our intertwining, our changing, various and particular. So much that is strange and new. Now a plate of food, yellow eggs, green kale, your favourite. The anticipation of bitter coffee and times, various, with you. Okay, so they are the three remaining poems from the sequence that seemed to lead to this poem, uh, which is the title poem uh, of my collection. It's called Moonrass. 
Um, and for those who don't know, a moonrass is a species of fish that undergoes a female to male gender transition in midlife. So this is moonrass. <clears throat> Here you are, my blue moon, Ras, newborn, barely imagined being. I see you with a new lucency, clear as the blue of your new man's suit, sweet as the sky, true as day. Back and forth you carve this place of ours, continuing a persistent insistence on incessant activity you always loved to dance. Some things change, some stay the same. Here you are forming, transforming, twinkling your webbed toes, shaking your tail crescent. Lyaras, we cycle through the dappled light of the casuarina, holding hands like younger lovers in a film, in a dream. All is calm and comfort here. Moving in our translucent cocoon, self-made and safe as houses, or as a fresh-made pair of parrotfish pyjamas. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Mila. Now, I couldn't help but notice um, notes uh, being taken, and I think questions as well. Um, so I'd like now to transition to a more informal part of our uh, afternoon together where, you know, perhaps we share some of the moments in the poems that were um, either a form of stuckness or uh, perhaps um, hold some insight into what it's like to not be stuck. <laughs> um, so um, thank you. Perhaps we'll loosely st start again with Oz, but... I think at this point we could, uh, you know, potentially make it a conversation as well. And thank you. Oof, dazzled. Um, what can I say? Yeah, I mean, I made that sort of uh, offhand remark that I'm never stuck, um, uh, which I think in in poetry, and um, you mentioned this earlier on. Apparently, I've said it somewhere publicly because you picked me up on it. Um, that is the one area that I'm not stuck. Um, I don't deal with the, the three-dimensional world very well, but in my head and little squares of text, everything's fine and it's always there. Um, having said which, and I think it's something that you said, Willow, about that, the, you know, some, occasionally something comes easily, it's because you've put all the work in behind. I'm, one of my, my great strengths in life is being obsessive. And, and so I, I write every day, you know, and it's, it's one of those things that I say, you know, to my students all the time, they go, oh, you know, I'm, I'm not inspired. And it's, you know, I, I, I was inspired once, I think. I wasn't, I'm not quite sure, <laughs> but I think it was in the 80s. And I was, I was walking in to work one morning and alongside the railway track and it was a beautiful day and suddenly, ah, and I it might have been inspiration, but I've never written about it. Um, the, the writing comes from observing and just keep writing and just doing that all the time. And, and thinking about, um, I mean, it's interesting, you know, what, what are you going to write about as well? And I think I tend to find that once I've started writing. Um, I mentioned the, the little chat book that's just come out, My Life as a Time Traveller. Um, which is, I, I somewhat scurrilously um, gave it this um, subtitle of a memoir in 18 discrete fragments. Um, I'm not very good with time. Um, I'm very good at punctuality and I'm genuinely, generally early for everything. But in terms of time and thinking of things in a linear fashion, I, I don't. Simply, you know, things are either now or sometimes recently, but then there's this past, and they don't always stay in the same area. Sometimes something past becomes very present. Um, it's turning into a therapy group, isn't it? Um, but because of that, 
you know, these are poems that sort of grew out of that experience of not really noticing changes in time. And, and I just found that that was the impetus to write for a long time. And they didn't, it wasn't with, I'm going to write about it, it's just that's what I wanted to write about. So there's something about that, you know, general, and I think I mentioned it when I read out my first poem, that sort of sense of having an unremarkable life but paying attention to it all the time. And there's always things there to write about. You know, we're sat in this room here, which is very weird. Um, we're, we're in this odd sort of arrangement and hello, there's, there's people up there apparently, uh, which is weird in itself. We've got used to it recently, but you know, you look around this room and it's very sort of modern and functional. But there's some things outside, I'm not quite sure what they are, and they, they look like teeth to me. Um, and then for some reason, I'm looking at that wall there, and it's sort of shiny and things out. And it, and it struck me now, it looks like a glass tank full of toothpaste. Um, and so that's, that's what I'm going to take away from me. We've got this glass tank full of toothpaste and so on, and we've been tasting things here, and there's something foody going on. And I will on the train back, I'll be sort of sketching out, okay, toothpaste, and bringing these things together. So um, that's sort of my process in writing in many ways. I, I tend to write first thing in the morning before the magic of coffee has kicked in. And, and it is about the chaos and, and ordering the chaos. And I think it's good to let the chaos in and then not necessarily make sense of it, but sort of take a little bit that looks beautiful. Um, because life is chaos. I, I distrust narrative enormously. Um, causality, maybe, maybe not. But narrative, definitely not. And so I just like framing the chaos into attractive patterns, which sounds very shallow, but actually it's where you start picking up those things that really matter to you and quite often touch on the things that you don't necessarily want to say directly. You know, that, um, that thing of Paul saying the unsayable. Um, whether anyone gets the unsayable, I don't know. Um, I suppose I could put out footnotes into them as well and tell people what it all means, but I, 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 the sort of writing I do, I prefer to let someone find their own way through it, I guess. I, sorry, I'm, I'm rambling on, not giving anyone else a chance. But um, that, that's, my, that's my thoughts on the matter. Thank you, Paul. I guess in, in some ways, perhaps, um, you know, sort of that wonderful I idea of the, of the memory um, and its ability to, um, so, or, you know, sort of that thing inside ourselves that determines what matters. Um, the, I think, this, you know, that image in the storyteller and um, where on your deathbed you don't get to choose what, <laughs> what, you what story you're telling. <laughs> yeah, or, or what comes to mind. Um, and, I mean, I mean, Marcel, I know you've worked so much with memory um, mm. in, in order to um, sort of sift through experiences. Um, and so it's interesting that uh, for you there's not the, the starkness so much there, but then I think both... Um, and 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 it's just a stuckness. Is there is there stuckness uh, on occasion? Ah, uh, I think that's a permanent place <laughs> from which I operate, not only in creative work but in you know in general and uncertainty. But certainly in creative practice, yeah, I've had to just stop writing for large periods of time. And I'm a musician. I've had to stop playing music for large periods of time too. It's and it just seems to be part of the. Um, it's an integral part of the process for me. Yeah. And panicking, going, I just cannot do this, cannot do this. And then going, oh, it's OK, I, I know now how to do it. So yeah, it, I don't know how you get from one side to the other, apart from showing up and doing the work. Yep. Yeah, yeah. just writing, writing yeah. through. Yeah. yeah. Um, there's something really, I'm interested in um, what Oz said about writing before coffee. So you're in that liminal time, and maybe you're a little bit more, um, you're out of your own way, aren't you? You're a bit more, because um, I think, um, submission is important to this process um, and the showing up. Um, and, uh, you know, the research shows that too, you know, that it's the showing up to the page. Like the writers get stuck, I'm citing Rowena Murray here, um, writers get stuck because they, they think they have to work out what they think or what they want to say before they can write um, instead of using writing to work out what it is that you want to say. Like you don't, you figure it out by meeting with the page. Um, 
But that doesn't mean that that's not terrifying sometimes or that what's showing up on the page is scary or not what you th think should be there or not the way that you thought you were going to talk about that thing or something that you don't want to talk about or um, not sounding how you hoped it would. There's a whole range of reasons that all this kind of meta level of stuckness can happen. Um, but I definitely think that, yeah, the only way through is by that showing up. Yeah, and that might not be necessarily, um, or certainly for me, it's not necessarily always um, realising a poem every day. It might be a vignette, it might even just be some list work. I know for those poems, there was that the sequence that I was kind of trying and flailing about and writing. Um, I wrote some dates down about this. So I think that sequence I was you know, feeling very lost trying to write that sequence in around April and May. Um, and then I was also doing my PhD. So then I kind of, you know, accepted defeat on those poems for a little while. <laughs> and then just was working on the research for a little while. Um, and then I noticed in my journals um, in about August, um, I really thought, you know, actually I thought I was going to have to stop doing my PhD because I couldn't that. figure out what was, um, like I was going to have to yeah. quit. Yes. Um, yes. Yeah, you remember. Yeah. Uh, yeah, and then I was just doing some list work. I just did list work at that time. So not poems, just being content with getting some list work down, um, by which I mean, you know, putting different things together. And I thought it was interesting that Oz spoke about that before as well. I wonder if that's something that you formally do, like just list work or does that, how does that look formally for you? Yeah, it's, I do like a good list. <laughs> I, 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 I'm very, I like putting things in order. Um, and I think that that is a good way of, of getting, getting things moving. And, and yeah, definitely. Yeah, but, so no poems arose for me at that time, but I just was like, okay, that's some interesting list work. And then it wasn't until the November, so that's seven months after that sequence, um, that um, a chance conversation uh, with my partner, um, not even about a moon race, about an axolotl uh, occurred. And there had been an axolotl in one of the poems that didn't make it in that sequence. And I, that's something I think is important as well, being alert to serendipity to chance encounters yeah um, and so somehow that grabbed me that morning and then I went you know down this little research rabbit hole and discovered all these things about the moon rass, um, instead um, which and I was as I was noting them down it was almost like writing a list um, about the person that is at the heart of that poem it was just so close and then a vignette formed from that very easily and then all I had to do was shape it on the page. And then it was just there after seven months of, you know, flailing around and thinking, I can only write about this, but no, I can't write about this, you know? So, mm. Yeah, when you're not writing the poem, you are writing the poem, yeah, aren't you? Right. If you're consciously not writing it, you're definitely writing it. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah um, it's so interesting to see you know, how we articulate our process and non-process, which is actually process, really. Um, and um, it's re for me, I was thinking about this for today, and this particular project that I'm doing, being a memoir, has thrown a lot of sticky things at me. Um, and you probably didn't realise, because there's a fair bit of narrative in the poems that I wrote, but one of the things that sticks, that I have to be careful of, is that I write poems and not stories. And I've, got a, a, I've actually got a, a note on my desk, if on the, stuck to the computer, that says write poems, not stories. Because there's a, a constant <coughs> tendency to, you know, to really over narrate, well, not even over narrate, just to tell the story. Um, so um, I will all, the, the work itself demands that there has to be, for me, uh, a certain amount of narrative. And I, I believe all poems have narrative of some kind anyway. Uh, even if it's full of gaps, there's a kind of sense of narrativity because that's what our minds do. Um, even when we're bulking against it, there will be, um, you know, that sort of connecting that we do, which we turn to a kind of odd sort of narrative. 
So that's one of, been one of my, my things, is, 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 is what will go well in the poem? Because there's always so much more uh, with, with memory. That, so that, that's the thing that um, I've struggled with. I mean, the mine shaft, oh, it kept having more and more stuff, and then more and more stuff was thrown out. And um, it was a really hard poem to write. Partly also, and I'm glad I did it this way, was because I started on this two-line structure, couplets, right at the beginning, before I even started writing it. It's, it came to me because I wanted to do something about descent, that sort of um, catabasis, this kind of descent into hell idea. And the, then I remembered, oh, hang on, I went down a mine shaft. Yes, I did that. Uh, I'd forgotten about that mine shaft thing. And then thought, OK, that can be my sort of portal into, memory portal into this uh, poem. But um, also, the way that I'm approaching these memories now is a way that I've never done quite the same way. I, I did have a tendency to allow myself to fall toward, towards nostalgia and sto or story in some of my longer poems. Um, because that was a way for me of ma making a shape out of the chaos. Um, but here I've really tried to be more honest <laughs> uh, because what, the reason why I've actually done that kind of nostalgia stuff has been a kind of forgetting. So I wanted to keep that door of forgetting open so that I wasn't doing that. And so that I was then going to have to deal with some really difficult stuff. And that's really been the main ethical and personal and existential issue for me with this um, series. And sometimes I've actually had to take stuff out, which is just too revealing. Um, but I'm finding a balance there. Um, so that's another sort of a, an idea that came to me a few months into the project, and it's another one that stuck with me, was when you get stuck, the problem might not be existential, it might just be technical. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I might have read it somewhere, but it just stayed in my head because really, is it just a matter of changing the pronouns or finding an image rather than rattling on about something? Um, and so, yeah, that was a way for me to get around stuckness, to say, okay, what is the real problem here? And very often it was because the poem was kind of morphing. It wasn't, you know, I needed to really start attending more to the poetry of the thing. Um, so that's been a big one. And another one uh, area of stuckness has been um, because a lot of the stuff I do write about happened when I was a very young child and I wouldn't have known. And I've been doing a lot of reading, um, which has been often very devastating to me. And the the Huddleston book was one of those. Um, but then, um, you know, having, um, just having to do that research, it's been, it's been time to put aside the poetry and just read. But I then haven't uh, tried to apply it in any particular way. I've just let it sort of imbue what's around, you know. So that's, um, that's it, yeah. And, and then dealing with certain words like pronouns, like I, <laughs> or little I, or you. I found you quite handy because it gives me distance. Yeah. Or um, just using simple words like black and white, <laughs> which I find it almost impossible to write the word white or black without getting into a whole kind of space because my, my work is around whiteness, blackness. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So. I'm interested in that, uh, well, all of it, but um, I think particularly that idea of, and you said it in your introduction as well, of having so much memory and research, and then it's what you excise from that. Yes. And I do wonder, and you know, you were mentioning about the, the blank page. I mean, I always think that rather than thinking about you've got this blank page you've got to put something on, think about the, the whole mass of stuff you've got and take stuff away rather than creating something. Mm. Take away the things you don't need and it's that, you know, attrib attributed, to, attributed to Michelangelo that, you know, how do you carve an angel where you take a stone that's got an angel in it and take away all the bits that aren't an angel. You know, if, if you think of writing a poem like that perhaps, you know, it takes away that sort of fear of having a blank page. You know, I've got all this memory, all this research, all this knowledge 
knowledge, and you just take away the bits until you've just got the poem in the middle. Yes. And I think that's kind of an interesting way of approaching things. Absolutely, and, and, I, and I do tend to do that. But even as I've read the one about the Huddleston book here, I came to the end, I thought, it's too long. Um, <laughs> I have to take some more out of there. So, you know, um, but you're right, it is, it's a matter of pairing away yeah. until you, you reach where you are. And, and, and this poem about the mine shaft was really a, a, an example for me of how far I could do that. Yeah, but it is. I like the cutting away of the stone. Nice idea. I think something else that's, that's also in a number, and it's just, you know, and particularly with your eggplant poem, Elizabeth, that sort of conversation with other writers as well. You know, not necessarily copying something someone's done, but that real, there's a real sense of dialogue with other, another work there which I think is an interesting thing. Is that something that you...? Yeah, I think so. And I, I, I hadn't really even thought of it as being a poem. I was really just recording what... I was very moved by that poem. And it sort of travelled with me through the weekend. Um, and then I wrote about that just in a, a student forum. Um, and Michelle said, no, no, keep going with that. Like, OK. So I hadn't really thought of it. But yeah, and that being in dialogue with creativity, whether it's, it could be with food, but also for me, um, creativity should be, has to be in dialogue with other forms of creativity. So if I'm writing, my way almost of discharging the creative energy is to go and make music. Or if I'm making music, the way of, of, of letting out that creative energy is to draw or paint perhaps. But, um, and creating different uh, elements that way, that one creative process seems to, to, to shape the other, and that would even extend to, I would say, growing food and cooking, but also into the physical, which I know Michelle and I both uh, swim. And so I think the physical element of creativity, so the walk, the walking meditation, or the lap swimming, where the ideas that you were stuck on, um, they, they seem to walk you through it or swim you through it. Yeah, so I think those things are all very relevant. And I did bring this to show to Will, <laughs> which is a, um, a poem, a prose poem, um, written on a, a piano scroll, uh, which is, yeah, which I've, I've which uh, Jimmy's in the corner here. I started this in part of Jimmy's uh, program. And I wrote a prose poem based on research that I did with Jimmy for Willow's unit. And then I wrote it onto a piano scroll and then, of course, made a video and a piano soundtrack for it. <laughs> so, yeah. One thing leads to another in creativity. <laughs> Something I've um, struggled over many years to um, allow space for was this understanding that my movement practices were not in competition with my writing practice. It yeah. was just all part of it. Um, for a long time, I felt this like, oh, I'm spending too long doing yoga, or then I, I'm not going to have enough time for my writing. Um, yeah, but it's actually there; it's all necessary. Yeah, 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 yeah. I think so. <laughs> the, the, I think you do too. <laughs> the, um, the first poem in that sequence was written about um, this place I was living in the time uh, that I was doing my PhD. There was it's um, there's like a re. Uh, <laughs> Um, rehabilitated land there and uh, there's this kind of helix mountain structure that I guess has got garbage within it. Um, anyway, it's been rehabilitated it's, and there's all reeds and everything there um, and I would walk every day around this mm. helix structure. It's like a, a, that's almost like a monk. Have you been to, there's a church um, at a place uh, on the south coast called Badala and it has a, a it's an old stone church and it has a, a garden that is a circle within a circle within a circle and the idea is that you enter and you walk the circle and whilst you're working this, walking the circle you're letting some form of a god resolve whatever it is that you're working on. Hmm. Yeah. Like the labyrinth. It's a labyrinth, yeah. Like the labyrinth at yeah. Centennial Park. I often walk that one. Yeah, right. Does yes. it work? Yes, it does, because you're, you're sort of moving around. Your perception is, is um, well, well, it's very peaceful to do it. And, and you're just simply allowing um, the way in which the directions and the 
the sort, just the way that changes of direction are allowing you to see things in a new way. So um, it, it's beautiful, mm -hmm. you know, um, and of course it depends on the day and the weather and the season. So, um, you know, you go there at different times. Always a new experience, like any walk. It just starts from the beginning. And I find walking is often a place. But I, I, I find I'm writing, because I'm not working here anymore and I'm retired, I'm actually writing in my head all the time. And it's really nice to be able to give my, my mind that space. You know, but, but yeah, um, doing things. Often if I'm stuck, just getting up and doing something, uh, even if it's something totally mundane, like I've got a pile of ironing or I'm gonna peel vegetables for dinner, you know, that can unstick. But just doing something with your hands. And I remember many, many years ago, um, a woman, a, very, a woman who was younger than me, she said to me, when the mind is, when the hands are busy, the mind is free. You know, and I think that's always stuck with me because, yeah, maybe, or even like maybe being on a train or a bus or, um, you know, um, where somebody else is doing something but you're still on the move. You know, someone else is, t you're yeah. kind of moving but you're not actually having to make it move. <laughs> yes, yeah. yeah I, where I work is about uh, probably a, an hour on the train and I get a lot of writing done. And, and it's a beautiful landscape that changes all the time and you look out the window. Oh dear. Oh, well, you know. Wreck bus. Yeah, write it down. <laughs> Does anyone else have times that they write particularly or is it just... All the time. <laughs> yeah. 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 We were just talking about um, buses and trains too though. Yeah. And uh, I like note taking on buses and trains too and taking journeys where you're not, you know, um, when you're driving there's, there's, there's all that stimulation but you can't actually work with it unless you're going to record your voice. But when you're on a bus or a train, more so than when walking as well, you can, you can actually be making notes and I think it's a beautiful way to, to, inter, to, inter, to exchange with, yeah, everything that's happening. Um, I need to write in the morning, but then um, sometimes that, if it's a good poetry day, that will run on yeah. for probably... Uh, Do you manage every morning? Um, no, I don't manage every morning. Cause I, cause My thinking, ambition is for yeah. it to be every weekday. Because I, <laughs> I do think about, you know, if we're sort of going back to that stuckness thing, and, and it is that, you know, I'm going to damn well write something, you know, yeah. at this time. And, and, you know, I find that first thing in the morning is the time that I do have a little space while I'm having a coffee and um, just, you know, start off. And it is part of that dialogue thing as well. I'm part of a, a prose poetry group with a few people, um, a number of whom are in Australia. So I will get up in the morning and someone will have shared something and I'll read that and that will go in as well as the news that's on the radio and um, thinking about what I have to do. And they'll all sort of come together and find some sort of interesting juxtapositions I can work with later on. Yeah, I, reading is definitely also writing, right? I yeah. think, yes, <laughs> yeah. uh, definitely is. It's totally it's integral to my practice, but also I maintain that line. Like they're they're so intertwined, you know. They're um, and I talk about this in a little bit of my research as well. That you know they are. Um, we can think of them as, you know, this kind of hybrid practice, reading, writing, writing, reading. Yeah, I, d I, I tend to agree. And I, I write, uh, at the moment, I'm reading very eclectically. I just basically just follow my nose, you know, whatever I, I, I feel like. But also, uh, I might find a reference to something and I'll, I'll grab it and I'll go with it and read it. And that's often generated, as you could see in the Pelandaba poem when I read the play. I couldn't believe it. I had this Pelandaba idea in my mind. <coughs> and then I read the Fugard and there was this thing about Pelandaba being, um, you know, what it meant in Surtu and, and, and Eugène Marais. And, and I just thought that's fascinating. I, I had gone to read that play because it was about Eugène Marais and I had had memories of his poetry when I was at school, um, which um, I found some wonderful translations of online, wonderful for Google, Google is amazing. Um, and, um, and, and yet 
there was all the stuff about um, you know his philosophy and and about Palindaba. I didn't know that had I for, you know for, I didn't know that Eugène Marais had gone to the farm at Palindaba. And I, even before that, I'd had this idea about this rock. Um, and so it was so serendipitous, you know. So re reading can do that. And and sometimes when you've got a, a creative poem, something going on in your mind, even in your subconscious. It starts to look like everything you do feeds it. Mm -hmm. um, so these yeah. things come to you. If you're if you're not in that space, sometimes things will come to you, but you may not recognise their their, their significance. You know, um, so that's something that I, I I love to be able to catch that, and, and that's why I said that writing Pelindaba for me was an easy process. It was an easy poem. It was already it had already started writing itself. Um, it, and it didn't present all that many problems to me. And all I simply did in that poem was choral together these places and things that had come to me with that particular word the, and that smell of the, of the felt and the, the rivers and the rocks and the birds, and, you know, that sort of memory of place. Right in the middle, though, there's the gated village image, isn't yes. that? And as soon as you put that in, that really shifts the frame. Oh yes, it does. It does. It's not just a poem about yeah. place. There's more, yeah. and I want that. Mm. I want that. I want it to. Is that what do you add to it to really, you know, all these wonderful details that you had? And you can and, go on you know, and on with those, can't yeah. you? And that's what I'm trying to avoid. That's why I was saying earlier there has to be a point to this yeah. in terms of what I'm doing. Um, and so it, it was the place and other significances about that place. It wasn't all, you know, that. But my first impressions of those rivers had been when I was a child, um, you know, and there was a sort of an innocence about those associations, uh, you know, and, and the birds and all of that. But then it was also about my more current visits back to a place that had a river running outside the fence where my mum was staying and it was a, a river that had become polluted it had been past Alexandra Township. So it was all of the, you know, the horrible things that it, South Africa had come to be. Um, and that was also um, had its own beauty, but um, yeah, that had to be in there. If I, I would have been dishonest with myself about what I was doing had I not actually brought in that gated, yeah. that, you know, that gated community and the barbed wire fence that needed to be there. But it just came. I was so, that's so rare that, that that you don't kind of struggle and mm. angst. <laughs> um, there's a, there's something about um, working dialogically that's to do with permission for me as well. So I think you know some days if I'm feeling stuck, it might be because I've got some you know permission to write kind of issues going on, and um, it's much easier for me on those days to strike up a dialogue with piece of text or a poem or something that I've just picked off the shelf um, and then th that's so much easier for me and and bypasses you know whatever dynamic is going on that's kind of about permissions um, about a, uh, a writing you know or maybe and, and perhaps that's um, a misperception as well like perhaps that's me laboring under that misperception that I need to be arriving with um, some preformed idea to the page and then working dialogically allows me to put that, you know, misapprehension down um, and just have a conversation, which is much easier. Mm. It's getting those bits of, those little bits of language, isn't it? I mean, as you were saying that you just sort of jot things down, mm. um, like you, things that you noticed and where we were. And one of the ways that I've been able to kind of collect ideas and, and poems for this current project, and thank God I did, because I've got a lot of messy notes in my notebooks that I can build on, um, was to just sort of use the notebook uh, as um, a place to sort of, sometimes I'll just write, I'll have an idea of a poem, and I'll just start writing maybe a few lines or um, a line, or even an entry point, because that's another place that I find it with these poems that I'm doing now in particular, how do I enter this, how do I take the reader into this memory in a way that can be 
meaningful and how that will make it work. And I can tell you that the, the first couple of bits of uh, the first six lines of the mine shaft were rewritten about 50 times because mm -hmm. I couldn't find my way in in a way that I was positioning this as simply a visit back into a theme park. You know, it was that logistical stuff, that's narrative skills. Um, I, you know, like, how do I, like, where do I come from mm. for this poem? And each of the ones that I read today had that kind of grappling with an entry into this particular memory. How can I put it in? You know, um, so, yeah, and, and sometimes I have to rewrite many, many times, many drafts, or I have to play around, as I said earlier, with the pronouns, um, because the I becomes too overwhelming. Um, and the you, I like the you, but I don't always use it, um, like I didn't in Pelandaba is I, and the other one is I, did my father, but mine shaft had to be a you. I tried it with an I and it was just cringeworthy. Um, <laughs> I couldn't be... Do you consider that to be second person? Yes. Yeah. And so do you need to specify who you is? No, no I don't. Because, well the you is me yeah. uh, as, an, as a narrator but it just gives me a little bit of distance and I do remember when I first started writing poetry Chris Mansell the uh, the, the Australian poet she I, I the first workshop I attended in in Australia was all the way back in the 1980s and um, she her thing was like if you can't say I say you um, <laughs> which was a really good little bit of advice because it does just give you that little bit even though you are writing your own <coughs> perspective it just gives you that little bit of Gra grammatical distancing mm -hmm. um, so that um, it becomes possible to say things mm -hmm. that you can't actually say as I mm -hmm. and for me that's invaluable here but again you can do too much you mm -hmm. as we know yes. <laughs> <laughs> we've told our students how many times it's like oh, you know? Even if you're a fan. Uh, so yeah but yes. pronouns are a constant grapple I'm finding. But that's um, another permissions thing, so that opens up a little space of permission to say things that you couldn't say with, when you were working under the eye. Yes, it is, and um, it's a way around not being able to say things. Yeah. You know, you, um, it, 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 that poem was a real learning experience for me. Um, uh, how, to, how to distance something. Um, I wrote another poem, which was also hard to write. Michelle, I think you've read it. It's what I call the pineapple poem. <laughs> and that was about a confrontation with a, with a young African woman when, when I was still, just before I left the country. And I found it, I had written it as I, and I hated that. I just found it so shameful, I couldn't do it. Um, so yeah, I turned to the you there. And that was, it was such a relief. <laughs> I went through the poem, I thought, right, I'm going to change it, and it just, it made me change a lot of the lines as well, um, but it just kind of, yeah, that's it, I got it, you know? Um, so just that, that's sort of what, that's why I was saying, maybe the problem isn't existential, it's technical. Well, I think technical in this, a, a couple of things that you've all talked about, the technical side of things in terms of, you also said that in the first instance you got you, um, you decided that it's going to have a certain form. Yeah. And I think s deciding on the form is really, um, you know, very important to, to concentrating things. But also in terms of permissions um, and limiting the form, you know, if it's a sphere, it's a sphere and it has to fit into the sphere. Mm -hmm. Um, and anything out extraneous to the sphere is not the sphere. But uh, in terms of permissions, I also do some work under um, a pseudonym and uh, I'm writing a particular topic under that pseudonym and when, it, when I started writing that particular topic under that pseudonym, I was then able to have permission to write, I, gave, I, I found permission suddenly to write at a deeper level with that topic that I hadn't been able to access for a long time and that I'd tried for decades to write about that topic and not able to access it at all. Mm -hmm. But as soon as I started writing it from actually not just first, second person, whatever, a different personality entirely. Yeah 
quietly, yeah, yeah. there it is, yeah. and straight into yeah, it. Yeah, yeah. So, so finding a, a dramatic persona. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think it's really yeah. powerful. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, I was going to ask Oz actually to talk about this um, about around form in prose poetry. Um, you know how that impacts uh, on what you put in and leave out, and uh, you know. Tune. Um, uh, yeah, oh, it, it doesn't necessarily impact in, in that sort of way we've just been talking about. It. I mean, it's, it's a box, you can put anything in. Um, the, 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 person I always, the person I always quote with, um, with prose poetry is Russell Edson with his, it's the shape of thought for him. And, uh, and I read that after I'd spent years trying to think, how can you describe it? And I got somewhere close to that. I said, oh, he's, he wrote that a couple of years ago. Um, but it is that the prose poem's one line, essentially, um, that just happens not to fit on the page, so you have to have soft returns in it. And it is, how, how long is my thought and what's generating it and where's it going? Um, and it is an impulse of... I suppose language, metaphor, and rhythm, beyond or before what it's about. I'll, dis I'll decide what it's about and make it about that later on. But I'll see what comes up, and it's what you were saying, Willow, in the, the sort of coming to and decide, finding what you think in the writing, I suppose. And it, the first draft is always, uh, how far can I take this? And it might. And it sounds sort of kind of whimsical. I read a couple of quite whimsical things, I, I, I think. Um, but actually, it can take you places that you really don't want to go sometimes um, in terms of, um, you know, distant, dark memories and all sorts of things. And, and yet, the linguistic, rhythmic joy of it takes you on to the end of the idea and you can do something beyond it with, with this first draft but there is something about that turning the poem becomes is more important than the thought and it certainly it's more important than I am um, and another one from years of teaching one of the first things I tell my students because we're you know we're a modern university we have all these things you're a name not a number you're a you're, you're at the heart of what we do. In the first session, I always say, you're not quite at the heart of everything. You're not the most important thing here. The subject's the most important. If you think you're as important as poetry, you're sorely mistaken. Um, and, you know, I, and it will take me to, you know, and I'll write about all sorts of terrible things in my writing because it, the, the words on the page are ultimately more important than my feelings or whatever. Mm -hmm. You know, it's you become. Uh, yeah, you know, it's not for everyone, but it is that trusting to this is an important art I'm doing, and it's it's difficult to talk about without sounding a bit up your own bottom, really. But it's it's phenomenally important to me. The arts are, and they are to everyone, even the people that think they're not, because if you took them away, they'd suddenly think, hang on, it's not all about this. Um, you know, and I think it is that sort of trusting to the importance of it in what you do, whether it's, you know, music or poetry or something. And, you know, and I think if you make that that important, and you might have all sorts of other commitments around which the world demands of you, but just making that little space to go, I'm going to do some important creative work today. I think that's, in this, you know, 20 minutes or whatever, I think it's a, it's a good, it will improve your life. I'd love to um, just, because we are coming towards the end, uh, I'd love to see if anyone on Zoom had questions or anyone in the room had some questions or and or just last, you know, sort of last thoughts um, for, for our Friday, for our lovely Friday afternoon. Um, it does, it does anyone have some some questions perhaps from, 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 from the room um, for our poets? Have we got some things in the chat? Or were they from before? Um, I was saying one of the things that we could read. I just didn't know. Nice, thank you. Thank, thank you. you. <laughs> That's lovely.
It's really good. And it's um, just a comment. It's just, it's, I write for any non fiction and it's eerie hearing all of these different processes, <coughs> how similar they are to the process of, of drafting something. Like, I will let something sit there and sometimes it will come in a month and it will be to do with those think, the random things that sort of happen. Or you can just let it sit there for, I had a piece sit there for like, I think it was about 12 months, a touch over, until I just happened upon something on Trove that was just the piece I needed, like the, the sort of the drawstring that sort of pulled it all together. Mm-hmm. And it was just there. And so then I just sat with it for a day and I just, I just wrote it out. And it was, yeah, it just took so long. Um, it's about trusting that waiting. I know, yeah, and, yeah. and you put that pressure on yourself to write every day and then hearing that it's really good to know that you don't have to have that pressure that that's okay you can just let that just eat yeah. and find its way yeah yeah yeah, yeah. So thank you I, I probably ought to say that i don't put pressure on myself to do it i love it it's you know it's what i do it's absolute pure joy it's um it's, it's one of the few things in life that isn't a pressure it's just a yay time yeah it's certainly my, it's certainly even though i've just given the example of this kind of fraught journey to this poem. It's certainly the genre for me that is the least fraught. <laughs> um, yeah, you know, compared to um, writing a, you know, My longest poem was something. seven years. Yeah. I had the beginning of it and it took seven years before I finished it. It's not a great poem. It's, it's, it, I was pleased with it when I finished it and I thought, yeah, got that. And um, that was a number of years ago, but you know these things do, and you start and you go, and you go back to it every so often. You do other things, and you go, no, it's still not right. But um, yeah, seven years. Which is yeah. I try and I try and write most days, but if a day goes by and I don't, I don't get too panicked about it because I know that it's kind of mashing around in my mind or my subconscious and I'll get back to it because I use the notebooks I've always got that sort of anchor that I've got stuff in there that I can go and work on if I just happen to lose the plot um, <laughs> which can happen you sort of just fall off and just lose it so but I do need to come back to it regularly um, you know in order to stay with it um, and it's funny because every time I, I sit down to write I still do those same old things, procrastinating, you know, faffing around chores, um, you know, and eventually I sit down, oh, you know, it's like, now, now I can do it. Like, why couldn't I just sit down and do it? But that's like just an old kind of default that, that you know, comes up. Um, but yeah, I'm enjoying writing more often now than I had when, did when I was teaching. Um, because I found that really did cut into my writing time a lot. Um, and I only used to really write during the end of year break. That was the only time. But I still managed to get two books out during that time. So some, <laughs> something must have been yeah. happening. Um, you know, but I had a poem that took me about seven years to write. Yes, yes, I, I, can, I really relate to that, Oz. Um, yeah, and uh, you know, I'm... Often a writing session for me is simply going back to what I've written and, and working on it and uh, doing myriad, myriad drafts because it does take time. One point you can think, oh yeah, it's okay, I've done it, put it away, look at it the next day and say, oh my God, you know, that's not working at all, that's not it. Um, you know, I'd have to go back and, um, you know, just being prepared to do that, I call that writing. Yeah. You know, I call all of that writing. I don't feel I always have to be producing something new. It's more a matter of shaping and honing what I've got um, and bringing it to where I want it to be, which I never know where I'm at that point, but there does come a time where you, you, you sort of put it aside and you keep start changing things and you put them back and you think, right, okay. <laughs> Maybe it's time to stop, but I can come back to it a few months later and then do a little more on it. Yeah, that, I suppose that's also why it's good to have multiple things on the boil so that you don't have that pressure that you need to be realising this one, one project, you know, every day. You can be still engaged with the broader, you know, suite of things that you're working on, um, but you don't have that pressure. There's a balance point, isn't there? Um, and I want to say as well, we should all keep in mind at all times uh, Rilke's Duino elegies that were, after, you know, arrived after a blockage of 
10 years. Mm. <laughs> you should all keep that in mind. <laughs> I'll assume it. Do, do we have any uh, last thoughts, last questions, last comments at all? Anything we wish we'd think that? I, I'd like to add that after Oz said about um, if you get it done, you know, you've improved something, I would just like to reflect um, this. Uh, somebody once, my, my partner once said to me that when you make music, you're making the universe a little bit bigger. And I think that's very much so of poetry as well as with music. So that's what I'd like to add. <laughs> oh, I love that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I'd like to say how much I've enjoyed this discussion with um, all, all of you. I hadn't met you before, Liz, and with Willow, who we've had many discussions on poetry and Oz. It's been wonderful. Um, so I feel, yeah, um, I feel inspired to do some prose poetry. Inspired? <sighs> Yeah, it's fine. <laughs> I'll let you know. <laughs> Keep that space open. <laughs> I mean, the end of the word is a terrible word, isn't it? Talk, think about it as an in breath. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, much better, much much less loaded. Yep. <laughs> you know, but there's a, there's this kind of um, I'm excited about it. Yeah, yeah. So, you know, that's that's good, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, it's it's been really enjoyable. It's yeah, a, a, a relief. Um, you know, because you sort of look forward to these things and you think, hang on, at a table with a bunch of people, I don't know, it's a bit weird, isn't it? And, and we've got to wait for the cakes. And, um, <laughs> and, and anyone on Zoom, you're missing that. Um, <laughs> uh, the real reason we really the, re the, the real reason is the cakes. Um, but, um, but no, it's, it's been really, uh, really stimulating. And, um, and just all that, as people reading, looking at the different forms as well, with your two lines and your leaves and your, and then it's, it's interesting to see on the page what they look like as well. Um, yeah, good, thank you, for, thank you for having me along. Look, I'd love to thank everyone for attending here today, everyone on Zoom, everyone in the room, um, anyone close and far away. Um, it really made the event very special. Um, a particular thanks to Dr. Jimmy Van, who was so instrumental in making this into a, a masterclass and making it happen, and to the, the amazing Kwa Tran, who's not getting out of it that easily. <laughs> um, so thank you to everyone. A really huge thanks to our poets, um, Professor Oz Hardwick, Associate Professor Marcel Freeman, Dr. Willow Drummond, amazing, and Elizabeth Walton. Uh, thank you to everyone, um, and onwards and dangerous. We got um, Before we turn off, I just want to um, look at Jocelyn's comment yes. there. I found a deadline is great for unstopping the creative pressure and letting the ideas flow. Um, yes, thanks, Jocelyn. That's um, That one doesn't really work for me, but I can imagine for other people it might. It depends how serious the deadline is. <laughs> Jocelyn, I'd like to say a deadline really works for me and I find a deadline to work similar to the way that I find form to work. So if I have form to work to or if I have a deadline to work to, both of those work for me. Is there a constraint? Yeah. 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 Great point, Jocelyn.